One of my most anticipated games of this year, it's Software's Doom Eternal, is finally here. In today's video, I want to share my thoughts on my first playthrough of the campaign and the latest entry of the long-running and beloved Doom franchise. Please keep in mind that I will not be discussing the game's multiplayer portion, Battle Mode, at least not in this video. Let's get started. I've been playing Doom for quite a few years now. I spent a good amount of time with each entry in the mainline series, outside of spin-offs like Doom RPG. As I've mentioned in previous videos, I'm not just a huge Doom fan, but a fan of id Software as a whole. As you might expect, I was incredibly excited to play Doom Eternal. I'm happy to report that the wait has been well worth it. In case you're interested, for my first playthrough I stuck with the Hurt Me Plenty difficulty level, Doom's equivalent to normal in most other games. Hurt Me Plenty offered plenty of challenge without turning up the heat too much, and now that I've completed the game, I feel that I have enough practice to tackle another playthrough on ultraviolence without too much trouble. But before we dive too deep into the gameplay, let's discuss the game's story. In case you missed the disclaimer at the beginning of this video, I'll be spoiling some major plot elements. If you plan on playing through the game yourself or otherwise want to avoid spoilers, stop here until you've had the chance to experience the game yourself. Doom Eternal picks up some amount of time after the ending of Doom 2016, after Samuel Hayden forces the Crucible away from the Slayer and transports him somewhere else. The game never clarifies exactly where he's sent or quite how much time has passed since then. However, it's been long enough for Hell to overrun most of Earth. Not that I imagine that would take very long. In fact, the game's intro makes it clear that approximately 60% of Earth's population has been wiped out. The world's governments and military forces came together to fight a common enemy, the governments forming the Allied Nations, and the military forces forming ARC, or Armored Response Coalition. Needless to say, the demons made short work of most military resistance and were very much winning the war against the humans. In the time between Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal, the Slayer has been able to recover the Fortress of Doom, his ancient Sentinel battle station and install Vega, the UAC's AI from Doom 2016, into the Fortress's computer systems. The Slayer is obviously less than thrilled with the current state of Earth, and takes it upon himself to set things right, hunting down the three Hell Priests to do so, with the help of Vega. The Hell Priests were former Sentinel Priests who sided with Hell, transforming them physically into more demonic beings. The Priests are essentially leading the invasion of Earth, and in killing them, the Slayer cuts down significantly on the demonic consumption of the planet. In his quest to return Earth to its natural state and give humanity a chance to survive, Another antagonist is revealed, the Con Maker. Ruler of the Makers, Doom's equivalent to Angels, the Con Maker organized Hell's invasion of Earth in order to gain enough Argent energy to sustain her dying homeworld, Erdak, Doom's equivalent to Heaven. This intentional invasion of Earth breaks ancient rules set in place for both the Makers and the Demons, which prevents them from meddling in mortal affairs. But how does invading Earth have anything to do with Argent energy? Well, Argent energy is revealed to be created in Hell using human souls. The Hellish invasion of Earth would be a pretty effective way to replenish that supply. Additionally, Eternal delves much deeper into the Slayer's relationship with the Sentinels, and confirms that he is indeed the original Doom guy, the protagonist of Doom, Doom 2, and Doom 64. The Sentinels pledged their loyalty to the Makers in ancient times, as the Makers had given them the gift of Argent Energy and very advanced technology. When the Sentinels found the Slayer delirious from fighting the demons in previous Doom titles, this was still the case. The Slayer, after receiving Sentinel training and proving his worth in battle against the demons, was welcomed into Sentinel ranks and pledged allegiance to the Makers as well. The events of Doom Eternal are very much a test of the Slayer's true loyalty, with the spirit of the Sentinel King, the Con Maker, and the Hell Priest warning him that he would be defying the Makers and by association the Sentinels by saving Earth. In fact, by killing the Hell Priest, the Slayer would be spilling the blood of Sentinels, something frowned upon to say the very least. The Slayer, however, perseveres and continues to fight both Hell aligned former Sentinels, Hell itself, and the Makers in order to save his people, humanity. Now that we've discussed the story, let's talk about gameplay. Movement is a building block of Doom's gameplay, and Doom Eternal adds a few neat touches. Overall, you move a bit slower than in Doom 2016, but the game makes up for this by giving you a new ability early in the game, the dash. With the dash ability, you are able to boost twice forward, backwards, left, or right, which is great for navigating quickly on the ground, dodging enemy attacks, or moving in midair. Both dashes are also refilled shortly after they're used. This leads into a somewhat divisive element of Eternal's gameplay, the platforming sections. Yes, Doom Eternal is pretty heavy on platforming elements, with areas between encounters being filled with scalable walls, monkey bars, actual floating platforms, and dash refills, instantly refilling your two mid-air dashes if grabbed. At first, I wasn't sure how to feel about this, but as I played, the concept grew on me. It was fun to scale these huge structures leaping from wall to wall and discovering new secret areas, but I'm a fan of platformers, so your mileage may vary. With the addition of monkey bars in combat arenas as well, you have yet another opportunity for continuous movement, allowing you to speed around arenas while fighting hordes of demons. But the real meat and potatoes of Doom is the combat. Looking back on Doom 2016's gameplay, it was a fantastic combination of the speed and skill of the classic Doom games, with a few modern sensibilities such as glory kills to spice things up and keep new players engaged. These new concepts were a lot of fun and really cemented id's idea of push-forward combat, or combat that forces the player to play aggressively and push forward, 
rather than take cover and play more defensively. That said, there were a few common complaints, including that the game could be completed using primarily just a few weapons. The super shotgun was a particularly popular choice, but who could blame anyone for that? It seems to me that id's goal with Doom Eternal was engagement, denying the player the ability to blast through the game with nothing but the super shotgun or rocket launcher, all in order to get the player thinking about their strategy. This is accomplished by requiring you to watch your resources. You can hold much less ammo, and the ammo pickups in the environment are few and far between, especially compared to previous Doom games. In order to fill back up on ammo, you're going to have to use the chainsaw, since chainsaw demons drop tons of it. The chainsaw is now mapped to its own key, no doubt due to its increased importance, and only requires a single button press to use. It still uses fuel like the chainsaw of Doom 2016, but at least one cell is regenerated over a short period of time in order to ensure you always have access to ammo. The demons still require a different amount of fuel cells to chainsaw depending on their strength. For example, relatively weaker demons such as the possessed, gargoyles, imps, or possessed soldiers only require one cell, while stronger demons require two or three. And of course, glory kills are back. How can they not be? They serve the same purpose as in Doom 2016, making demons drop health. Given Doom Eternal's higher level of difficulty, its glory kills are even more essential and can bring you from nearly dead back to mostly full health in a few seconds. In order to introduce some variety to glory kills, the Slayer now has a retractable arm-mounted blade, the Doom Blade. It's really only used in glory kills, but seeing the Slayer slice and stab his way through all manner of hellspawn is just as entertaining as you might think. Now, let's talk weapons. The classic Doom lineup of the shotgun, super shotgun, chain gun, rocket launcher, plasma rifle, BFG, and chainsaw are still here. With the additions of the heavy cannon, which is essentially a more powerful heavy assault rifle from Doom 2016, the ballista, an energy-based weapon similar to the gauss cannon from Doom 2016, the unmaker, a returning heavy weapon from Doom 64 with some notable alterations, and the crucible, the slayer's argent energy blade from his sentinel days. The BFG is mostly the same, using a limited ammo supply and clearing most of the area. The Unmaker shares the BFG's ammo, instead firing a barrage of energy orbs that do a ton of damage. Like the BFG, you'll want to save this for the more powerful demons. The Crucible is a one-hit kill on most demons. It uses unique ammo and can only hold three cells at a time. Alongside these is the shoulder-mounted cannon. It can shoot frag grenades, which explode and cause basic damage, ice bombs, which freeze demons to keep them still for a moment, and a burst of flames known as the Flame Belch, which sets demons on fire and makes them drop armor. All shoulder cannon weapons reload on time recharges rather than requiring ammo collected from the world or via the chainsaw. The pistol does not return in Eternal, despite still existing in the game's files and being accessible through cheats on PC. But after acquiring most of the weapons, I can't say I missed it too terribly much. The returning weapons are all very similar to their previous versions, but they all have some differences, either in general functionality or weapon mods. One last new combat feature is the Blood Punch. Recharged by glory killing demons, the Blood Punch basically acts as an instant glory kill on weaker demons and deals a lot of damage to stronger ones. Like Doom 2016, most non-heavy weapons have two weapon mods available, which are obtained through Vega-branded drones scattered throughout most of the game's levels. Many weapon mods return from Doom 2016, with some receiving new mods. All of the weapon mods got regular use during my playthrough, something I can't say about each mod in Doom 2016. Of course, some got more than others. Some of my favorites are the Heavy Cannon Scope and the Shotgun Sticky Bombs, which are wonderful for taking out weak points. More on that later. Other fantastic mods are the Ballista's Arbalist, a bolt that sticks into demons and detonates after a short time, the Plasma Gun's Heat Blast, which charges while firing the weapon normally and releases a cone of highly damaging heat directly in front of it, and the Chain Gun's Shield, protecting the player for a short time while they mow down enemies. Mods can be upgraded with weapon upgrade points, buffing some aspect of the mod's functionality. Weapon upgrade points are earned not only by finishing the standard combat encounters in each level, but secret encounters and special challenges known as Slayer Gates. Secret encounters can be started by finding purple gore nests hidden in each level, giving the player a time limit and a few demons to kill before it expires. Successfully finishing one will earn you a weapon upgrade point. Six Slayer Gates can be found throughout the game, containing a gore nest behind a locked gate. After hunting down a nearby key, you can open the gate and activate the gore nest inside, which teleports you to a secret, incredibly challenging combat arena. Don't be surprised to see demons introduce levels early in Slayer Gates, should you decide to hunt them down. Finishing one will not only net you a weapon upgrade point, but an Empyrean Key. After finding all six, you can unlock the Unmaker in the Fortress of Doom. Additionally, each mod can be mastered, like Doom 2016, through completing challenges or finding hidden mastery tokens, new to Eternal. Mastering a weapon mod will add an additional feature to the mod. I can't go without mentioning the Super Shotguns only mod, which comes included with the weapon rather than being found separately through Vega drones. Known as the Meat Hook, the Super Shotgun has a chain and bladed hook mounted underneath it, which can be fired and hooks into demons. If a demon is pierced by the hook, the Slayer is pulled directly toward them. It's great for both quick navigation and closing the gap between you and particularly elusive demons. The Meat Hook's mastery is one of the best in the game. By mastering the Meat Hook, the hook and the chain itself will light on fire, setting the targeted demon ablaze. It performs the same function as the Flame Belch without using a Flame Belch charge, and it feels great to land a hit on a demon after pulling yourself towards them and seeing all that armor spill out of them. 
I could talk all day about weapon mods, but for the sake of brevity, it's probably best to move on for now. Like weapons, your suit can be upgraded as well. Using Praetor Tokens, medallions presented to you by Spirits of Sentinels, you can choose between a variety of upgrades for damage reduction, freeze bomb, flame belch, and more. Another set of upgrades includes runes, which alter gameplay to your benefit, such as slow motion while using mods or faster glory kill animations. Once a rune has been found, the player can select from a list of gameplay modifiers, which can be fit into three slots. All runes can be unlocked, but only three can be active at the same time. Since you need your guns to attack and you can no longer melee demons into a glory kill state, using the chainsaw is absolutely necessary. Alongside this, demons are tuned to be weaker to certain weapons, or contain weak points which can be destroyed much quicker through a specific weapon or two. The shields of shield soldiers can be quickly destroyed by using the plasma gun, resulting in an explosion that can also damage nearby demons. The gun of the Arachnatron, arm cannons of the Mancubus, and rocket launchers of the Revenant can be destroyed almost instantly by sticking them with the shotgun sticky bomb, or through a scoped heavy cannon shot. The Kako Demon can be instantly brought into a glory kill state by launching a sticky bomb into their open mouth. Nearly every demon has a particular weakness, and as such, you'll be switching weapons almost constantly while you play. Speaking of demons, the cast of Doom 2016 is back and quite a few return from Doom 2 that were absent in Doom 2016. The Arachnatron, Pain Elemental, and Archvile all return, serving similar roles to their original incarnations. The Arachnatron still fires energy shots but now launches grenades, the Pain Elemental still spawns lost souls, though it mostly throws them at you now, and the Archvile still has fire attacks, though he now buffs existing demons and spawns new ones, which of course are also buffed instead of resurrecting dead demons. He can also teleport short distances. He's still a huge pain, and I highly recommend taking him out as soon as possible. The BFG, Unmaker, and Crucible work great against him. The Prowler from Doom 2016's multiplayer is now added to the single-player lineup. It's similar to an Imp, but is a bit tougher and teleports frequently. Our returning demons are faster and more aggressive, in order to accommodate Eternal's more frantic gameplay. And the brand new demons are no exception. The Gargoyle is a new fodder demon, essentially a flying Imp. They're no issue and are great for getting ammo. There's the Carcass who isn't much of a threat but spawns energy shields to protect itself and other demons. If you happen to be using the Rocket Launcher and a Carcass shield spawns in front of you, you run the risk of blowing yourself up. The Dread Knight is a faster, stronger Hell Knight, and isn't to be underestimated. The Whiplash is incredibly quick, can slither across the ground and sneak up on you if you're preoccupied, which you probably are. They use whips and winning groups can easily take you out. It's best to use your Freeze Bomb when you spot them to prevent them from sneaking up on you. The Tyrants are a species of Cyber Demon using a very similar moveset to the Cyber Demon in 2016. In the late game, you'll be required to fight multiple at a time, so use their slow movement to your advantage and hit them with as many rockets as you can. Some new boss demons include the Doom Hunter, a demon on a floating tank or sled who uses the dual-bladed chainsaw from Doom 64, an arm-mounted plasma gun, and missiles. The Doom Hunter himself has an energy shield that can be destroyed by the plasma gun, similar to the shields of the shield soldiers and carcasses. Once destroyed, you can then damage it directly. However, by destroying its sled, the Doom Hunter cannot use its shield and remains consistently vulnerable. After the first boss encounter with the Doom Hunter, they will be added into the standard encounters in later levels. The Marauder is first encountered as a boss demon. Marauders are former Night Sentinels who sided with Hell, and are some of the toughest enemies you'll face in Eternal. They make use of an Argent X, a super shotgun, a shield, and can spawn a ghostly wolf. Marauders can only be damaged once their eyes flash green, giving the player a short window of time to deal damage. Otherwise, they will bring up a shield that cannot be destroyed, and will block every attack. Occasionally, they will spawn their wolf, which can be killed quickly, but will distract you from the Marauder itself. They are not weak to heavy weapons like the BFG, and will use different attacks depending on the distance between themselves and the Slayer. If the Slayer is far away, they can shoot energy blasts from their axe. If the player is too close, they'll fire the super shotgun or swing the axe itself. The best course of action is to stay about mid-range, dodging attacks and firing either the ballista or super shotgun every chance you get. By quick switching between these two weapons, you can take the Marauder out pretty quickly. Like the Doom Hunter, you'll find Marauders sprinkled into regular combat encounters later in the game. In the game's final missions, you also encounter Maker Drones, minions of the Con Maker that are invulnerable everywhere but their head. They aren't necessarily difficult to kill, but it can be a bit tricky to nail a headshot in a crowded arena. Hitting them with a powerful shot with the Heavy Cannon Scope will net you a ton of ammo, health, and armor, so they're definitely worth seeking out. Just make sure to avoid the lasers they shoot from their heads. You'll be busy throughout Doom Eternal. Between combat arenas, killing giant tentacles that pop out from holes in the ground, scaling walls, Swinging from monkey bars and finding the massive amount of secrets hidden throughout each of its impressively sprawling levels, you won't have much time to rest, unless you take a break in the Fortress of Doom. The Slayer's Battle Station is fully explorable between the missions, with the secrets you collect in levels littered throughout. Eternal packs most of its easter eggs here. Finding vinyl records in levels will allow you to listen to them in the Fortress, containing music from older Doom games and other games by id Software. Collectible toys of each demon can be collected and are placed on shelves, allowing you to view the character model of the toy and the demon. The Fortress of Doom has comic books, guitars, books with endless FPS, id, and Bethesda references in the titles, a modern gaming PC, and an MS-DOS computer you can play Doom and Doom 2 on, 
and references to the Slayer's Rabbit Daisy. The fortress is filled to the brim with neat things to find. You can also find secret items called Sentinel Batteries in levels, which allow you to unlock additional Vega Drones, Praetor Tokens, and armor. If you love hunting for collectibles and secrets in games, I think you'll have a lot of fun in Doom Eternal. Overall, I was really impressed with Doom Eternal. I feel it's described best as an evolution of Doom 2016, taking the aspects that work and throwing out many that don't. Not everyone was happy with the focus on platforming or the changes to combat, such as forcing weapon switching and an increased emphasis on managing resources, but I felt it also forced the player to think while they play, creating strategies as quickly as possible while avoiding attacks from every angle. And once you find your footing, it's incredibly engaging. Some areas, such as those using ooze to slow the player or requiring the player to swim through toxic water, can be a bit frustrating, but the rest of the game is such a fast-paced, frantic experience that I didn't mind too much when they cropped up. The visuals are gorgeous, and id Tech 7, the game's new engine, really shines with Eternal, showcasing the much better texture quality while maintaining high frame rates. The art style also leans toward the campy, somewhat cartoony horror movie style used in Doom and Doom 2, with many demons and items being redesigned to better match their classic counterparts. As a longtime fan of the classic Doom games, this was a delight to see. I was also very impressed with Mick Gordon's new soundtrack for Eternal, more memorable melodies and little musical references to Bobby Prince's Doom and Doom 2 soundtracks. Like most other elements of the game, the silliness of the story and some of the dialogue was cranked up in Eternal. If you're looking for a serious story, this game isn't for you. But if you're looking for polished, fast-paced gameplay, beautiful presentation, and a worthy successor to Doom 2016, look no further than Doom Eternal. Thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you next time.